If you'd like to contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or follow us on any of our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Live on Four Legs Podcast and on Twitter at Live on Four Legs Pod. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring Mr. Stone Gossip. Fucking camera in the truck. everybody now welcome to live on four legs the definitive live pearl jam podcast and we have something extremely special for you today we have two guests on who have been there from the very beginning pj30 was last week and look pj30 is the whole year we got a lot of time to celebrate so we figured this week we continued the celebration by bringing on rick and chris freel the guys from shadow mike's really good friends they were there the first show at the off ramp so we're going to talk to them about a lot of amazing stories so randy sobel over here chris buckley over there Welcome back to the show, and thank you, thank you for for doing this. Uh, John had a scheduling conflict and and couldn't be here, and I'm obviously, here. yeah, and and what a great opportunity for you to speak to these two like amazing people that have just been through all of this with them. Absolutely, I mean, you really said it right at the top, Randy. Uh, guys that have been there from the beginning, and yes, they're friends to Mike, but they're really family. I I, I think they really, when you think about it, and and you'll hear. From them, They're, they are family to Mike McCready, and it gives a very, very special, particular perspective to not just to Mike's story, but to the band story, to the Seattle scene, to everything that went into making Pearl Jam what they are now. So it's a very unique perspective, and it's the kind of thing where I, I don't really know where else you can get such a an up-close and first-hand perspective outside of maybe... Th- band members of Pearl Jam or another band from the scene. Sure. Guy, these are guys that were in bands in the scene yep. that were playing shows with the other bands that are, if you want to say, the the big four of Soundgarden, Nelson Chains, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, etc. These guys were in bands opening for these other bands, auditioning certain people, as we'll talk about that. with yep. these guys, and playing shows as time goes by visiting their friends at other shows, demoing certain songs that you know and love. It's extremely interesting. Highly recommend you stick around and listen. It's just the kind of thing where you want to hear these firsthand perspectives. I really, I truly, I'm not just saying it because we got to talk to them. I really believe that you really want to hear what they have to say because it is, you're never going to hear it anywhere else. 100%. And I think the best way to sell it is, if you have ever wondered what 1990, early 90s Seattle, and even the 80s in Seattle was like in that scene, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're the artists, man. They're painting the perfect picture. They're so, going to take you up close and personal. 100%. It. Yes. It, yeah. it was first hand accounts. It's I mean, a fantastic these guys lived it. They lived it. Yeah. Really down to earth, guys. And, uh, you know, when we start, we usually start with the question and answer kind of thing. But, but I have to start because the first thing we really talked about was busting a myth. And figuring, you know, we wanted to kind of get some answers on some things. And this kind of happened by accident. It's sort of amazing. And uh, there's only one way to really explain it. And that's just to kind of play the clip right here and to get into it. And it's just kind of amazing. This is a part of history that has never been discovered before or talked about before this. So we get into it here. We'll, we'll go through the questions and we'll, uh, yeah, just listen and enjoy and uh, we'll, we'll see you back at the end. 
I yeah, feel like too. we're going to be like breaking a lot of urban legends and myths today. Like just, sure, yeah. it just has this vibe <laughs> to it now that like we're going to we're going to take this this uh, this time machine back to the future, back to the they play just the girl. They play just. <laughs> well, what, I want to show you. I, I found all my old date books, and I, this is mine from two thousand. I mean, from uh, nineteen ninety. So I wow. have the day I went to the show. No wow. way. Oh, that's so, incredible. Wow. Yeah, I, I cleaned out my shed and I've been finding all my date books. So it's, wow. it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible to have that October 22. So it's uh, right there. So. And if anybody ever questioned you, you'd be like, it's in the book. It's in the date book. It's in the book. <laughs> it really happened, man. It really happened. We were there. I didn't write but it. But I do. I, I, I do have 30 to, years ago. Before we get too far, though, I do have to debunk one tiny thing. I, I, and Rick, I think, was talking about when we got on. There is still a little confusion if my wife Kim and Tim and Brian Kenny opened the show, and we actually saw Brian yesterday because he has a record store. Yeah, and we were you we do were a, picked, do, a, do a plug for the record store, the sure. high, high voltage, yeah, high voltage in Tacoma, and uh, he he claims it was not that show. He said it was with they played a benefit show with Allison Chains. That that could be right. Okay, maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. For some reason, I thought they opened, but. You might well, it, it would very much explain why my wife does not remember opening for Pearl Jam. <laughs> it sounds well, like something you'd remember. Mickey Blaylock, so. I don't know. I feel like yeah. you, might, you might remember that. I don't know. You know, I mean, I, th I think I don't think it was that show. Yeah, you're probably okay. right. I, I thought it was. But yeah, that, I guess that's going to remain an urban legend. Now, yeah. the one that was later, in, uh, like, I think it was December. They played two December shows. One is kind of one is a myth and one there's some that uh, that there's some information out there for. Uh, I feel the like one at New Melody, the one at the New Melody Tavern. I might have been that. I don't know if it was that or the Crocodile Cafe. Um, there, because I was, played on that one. That's the other thing that's kind of wild. I was I was looking that up yesterday, and they yeah New Melody, show, and it was. Yeah. It's funny because on Wikipedia it says <laughs> that's it's unclear. Too. It's unclear if they actually the played. And they they did the play, <laughs> and I and I and I sat in with them. It was only a couple of songs. Yeah, I remember that. So they played a, a show. December twenty second, nineteen ninety. Does that? Uh, that's a, the more that says. Can, can we go to the no. Facebook, please, Rick? Please go to. The <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's more accurate than Stat Tracker. Yeah, I, have, I have right there. Um, Mike at the more. Mike at uh, the more. Is that what you have in there? Uh, and, well, I wrote. I used to write people's initials. So I wrote MDM wow. list get for guest list more. It snowed that day. Yeah. Interesting. Isn't it? And not what was the what was the other date? Uh, uh, there was a December 19th show that there's not a lot of information about. I think it's the one I'm talking about is that the new melody and it was a benefit show and Allison Chains was supposed to play that too, but it snowed. So it got a lot of people bailed. But yeah. the, the way I remember it is that Jeff and Ed and Mike showed up. They did. And, and possibly Stone, and they didn't have any drummers, so they said, we're just going to get up. Yep, yeah, and just we're going to do a couple songs. I and have a music. February 26, 91. No, this February is in December. 20, this was December? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right. and, and, and if I remember right, I, it might have been saw, 91. I think they did Let Me Sleep. This is the one I remember. Yeah. Wow. In 90? Yeah. yeah if, if that's 91. The, that's got I'm just 91, guessing. Right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, here it is. No, it's, uh, this, oh, it was, it's in the date book. Here we go. Hang on. December new 21. Melody. December 21, acoustic, new melody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I played with we play, Krisha, we play. Kristen Berry. Mm -hmm. yeah. so this is 1990? The before, yeah, yeah the, day, the day before the more. It's oh. it's on Wikipedia. They, they just aren't yeah. sure if it actually happened, but it did happen. Yeah, and wow. I wrote down, it, there was snow those two days, so... Yeah, what that did, was New Melody. What did I say like five minutes ago? We were going to break some myths and legends <laughs> yeah. today? Like that's, We haven't even started yet. We already. haven't started and, and we've already... So, that, wow. that was like, so Chris actually got to play with Pearl Jam, which is... So what's the song, what is the song where he mentions Christmas time? Is that Let Me Sleep? That's, that's Let Me Sleep. sleep. Yeah. yeah, Let that's, Me Sleep, parentheses, it's Christmas time. I didn't even know that one. was even written at the yeah. time. Was that the uh, first the Christmas single? I, no. Uh, not the first one. One of the first few years, though. One of the first it was Ramblings years, 91. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There was Let Me Maybe Sleep. Maybe 92 Angel. or 93. Because that was that weird 10 inch, remember? Uh, yeah. Let Me Sleep was 91. That was the first oh, was one. It? All right. So it was. A yeah. One. Sonic Reducer was 92. Angel was 93. I was going to try to find it, but it's okay. 
I've got I've got a bunch of my Christmas records over there. So it was uh it was it was in ninety one. Yeah, that's okay. it. So that's yeah. the first one. Yeah. Wow. All right. So maybe awesome. maybe it was we're, right. we're, we're we're breaking Man. news here. It's like wow. CNN. We really are. All right. <laughs> Really, the first thing I want to know is, you know, 1990 set the scene, the stage of, of Seattle and what it was like and what the music scene was like back then. Nirvana's Bleach came out about a year before that. Alice in Chains, Soundgarden was pretty, it was starting to get pretty big. What was it like in that moment in time? And were people kind of the, expecting stuff to blow up? I would say no, we weren't expecting anything, but it was exciting because what you have to remember is to go back is that Chris and Mike and I moved to Hollywood because you couldn't even book a show in Seattle in 1987 because they had this teen dance ordinance. So we couldn't really play for kids. So we moved and basically as we moved to Hollywood, things started happening underground. People started playing shoe stores and other places. And so this scene develops by time we came back we came back um about may 3rd or may 4th 1988 there was a whole new scene happening and so it was building up organically and everything happened in seattle organically so even by 1990 it was still pretty small and it felt pretty uh local and supportive but there wasn't really a thought that it was going to blow up i think a, that feeling might have happened after 10 came out you know hmm. okay well yeah i mean we you gotta remember we were we were down in LA and even then, cause I was working at a record store, um, you know, Eric Johnson who worked for Pearl Jam he, he, later, he was down there. He had a coffee shop. Yeah. And, and he was telling us about Soundgarden. And then I, I met, I remember getting the, the first EP. Soundgarden EP into the store and hearing it and thinking, wow, you know, stuff, there's really interesting things happening. But right. we were pretty we were pretty locked into the L.A. thing because, we, you know, we were friends with Duff and, you know, obviously Guns was blowing up. And there was also a lot of great bands down there that were that we liked and that were happening. So we were kind of locked into that. And then we, we got, you know, fairly broke. So the idea was to come back to Seattle and kind of regroup and yeah. then go back possi again, possibly go back. But when we yeah. got back unbeknownst to us in some ways even though we were friends with so many people and we had heard about mother love bone and all these kind of you know mm -hmm. mud honey and these cool things that were happening uh you know and we were we obviously knew green river growing up and all that stuff that as soon as we got here we realized there were so many amazing things happening including mm -hmm. we got a rehearsal space pretty much right away and right across from us were was the very beginnings of what became alice in chains yeah so I think they were they probably were called Diamond Lie by then, or had just become Alice in Chains. So we kind of were like like right away we knew there were exciting things happening, and then yeah, when they still had the N apostrophe chain, I believe so. Oh, <laughs> yeah. There's yeah, a there good was, video that circulated yeah. that I saw really recently, and it must be Lane at like 18, 19 years old, and he's doing a, like a, an Axl Rose kind of shtick there. I don't know yeah, if you guys have seen that before. <laughs> Well, well I, they were very, they were very glammy, you know, they were yeah. very glammy and, 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 you know, Rick was never very glammy, but I was very into the oh. glam thing. And we, we, you know, we kind of brought some of that back, but you know, the fashion was kind of changing via guns and roses <laughs> and things. So by the time we got back, you know, there was still that kind of look going on. And I would say Alice or diamond lie. I can't remember what they were at that point. We're definitely falling into that, but I remember thinking that they sounded pretty amazing. Whereas, I don't think everybody else was quite on board with their no. sound yet. You know, I thought no, I they sounded they pretty different because they were just starting to do those harmonies that they really yeah. became known for. They were still, I think what they still were kind of more in like a skid row kind of vibe mm -hmm. when we got right. back. But, but there's yeah. also, like I said, I mean, there's no underestimating how important mother love bone was and mud yes. honey and all these really cool things that were going on that sort of set the stage for many other bands. And then, you know, Rick and I were, Mike left the band very soon after we got back. So we were kind of forging our own way too. So it's like, you're very interested in these other bands, but you're also very tied into just forging ahead and always moving and keep creating a, like we were ourselves. So, yeah, you know, and Mike had kind of, he, when he stepped away from us, he, he really stepped out for a while. He was like not playing guitar and just kind right. of like, wasn't yeah. quite sure where his next thing was going to be, but that didn't last very long. Very no. quickly, he, we he was getting into doing it. Yeah. 
<laughs> thing that, S- Stone like discovered he, him playing Stevie Ray somewhere, right? Well, I was going to well, yeah. R- Rick, yeah, Rick, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Rick. But, uh, well, the thing with Mike was that, you know, he came home and I think he felt kind of disillusioned. And also his, he was having the beginning of Crohn's systems, symptoms. We didn't know mm-hmm. what Crohn's was. And mm-hmm. so I think he just wanted to step away from music. And so, I mean, I'm sure you've read all about that, that he quit music, oh, yeah. yep, became yep. a Republican and worked at a video store and <laughs> all this stuff. And this, I didn't know about the became a Republican part. Yeah. <laughs> There's well, some again, regrets in there. Again, Gary. I think that would that would fall under the urban legend part. <laughs> 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 very probably very you know exaggerated. It probably lasted a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. But the thing with like, well we we would never let Mike quit playing guitar. We would have these really fun get togethers at there was Bruce Fairweather's house and Tim DeGiulio's place. So we would sit around and pass around acoustics and he'd always be there. Like, I'm not going to play it, but we'd always hand him the acoustic and we do, you know, dead flowers by the stones or a cheap trick song. And we always, you know, nobody was going to let Mike stop playing guitar. There was just no way, you know, we loved right. Mike. Like just play, come on, play. So we were always going to support him playing guitar. So that was the beginning. And then I think he started doing a band called love child, right, Chris? Yeah. And, that, and that's where we had a, uh, Rick and I had a band called Jangle Town and we played a yeah. show at the OK Hotel where we put Love Child on the show with Mike and some other guys and Stone and Jeff were at that show. Yeah. And I think that's where they really saw him kind of blaze. I mean, they, all, they yeah. obviously knew him from Shadow. I mean, we were friends yeah. with all those guys. So they already knew what he was capable of. I mean, Mike, Mike had already given guitar lessons to Stone over the years. and Right. And so, but I think to like, to really see him get up there and, you know, Love Child had kind of a Hendrix vibe and Mike was just over the top and really going for it. So I think they kind of knew that whatever Stone was writing and Jeff was writing, they could have him kind of as their secret weapon. Cause even within Mother Love Bone and Green River, there was never kind of like amazing, r- r- real hot shot guitar playing. No. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So right. th- I think they kind of knew yeah. that they could, they could use that to light those songs up and, I always felt like you could kind of hear that very immediately on that Temple of the Dog record. Like oh, yeah. right away, they kind of, none of those bands or any of those songs that had kind of like lead guitar that was really blowing up. And you hear that immediately on Say It a Little well, Heaven and I Reach mean, Down. And, yeah. You watch PJ20 and I mean, Cornell says it pretty much point blank. Like you have fun with that guys. You know, he's a monster. It's going to come out again or whatever, whatever the line is. But yeah. it's yeah. so yeah. prominent on that record. I think that's a very good uh, early showcase of him. And it's a great point that, you know, the other bands maybe didn't have that element. And yeah. then he, on that record, I mean, really kind of lets loose. I, I, I think you get that first taste of Mike, uh, the monster guitar player that he really was. You get that first taste of him. And, you know, you listen to some of those live performances of him back then. And even later, some of these other showcases and things that they did, it, it really comes through. So I think it's a, that's a very good point. I think it's like that. Good yeah. And, and I think also the, the Stevie Ravon thing is kind of right, right on point because when we were living in LA, uh, even before we left for LA, Mike had gotten into, into blues yeah, And I think it was just a natural progression. So he kind of up- applied some of that stuff uh, to that band. I think on the early parts of it, you hear a little of that Stevie Ray Vaughan, a little of that Hendrix influence before he kind of got into some other stuff. Yeah, there was an interesting thing that I read about how when in that period when he was kind of done and going to college and working at a video store that he went and saw Stevie Ray Vaughan at uh, the Gorge and uh, during one of the songs and uh, you guys probably know better than I do. I'm not a big Stevie Ray fan, but um, there was a song and I read it. I know what song it is um, where like the clouds just. Yeah. It opened up. Yeah. yeah opened up yeah. and it just started pouring and he, that's basically what inspired him to, to, get, back. to get back in. Yeah. 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 I wasn't there. My wife was at that show I mean, and it was apparently incredible. I got to see Stevie Ray Vaughan pretty early on at bumper shoot in Seattle before yeah. he, before he sobered up. Didn't you say he threw a, up or something? He did throw up. It took him a very long time to come on stage, <laughs> but uh, I'm always very thankful that I did see him. It was pretty incredible. And, but you know, it's funny. I think Mike gets tagged with that Stevie Ray thing, but mm. just because we grew up with him and I know what he was already doing and capable of, yeah. I mean, he was doing, he was doing all that guitar stuff in shadow. We would have parts in our show where, we would just leave the stage and he would just go bananas with a guitar yeah. and like, 
you know, he would like use baby dolls and all this kind of Alice yeah. Cooper stuff. And yeah. So it was like, even when people were hitting with the Stevie Ray thing, I always felt like he's already kind of got his thing. He's just maybe changing it a little bit with a little more of a blues feel. I mean, he was already technically very able via what we were already doing in shadow and all that. So I, I, I think, think I think a, I wasn't all that surprised, you know, he, he's a very good combination of all of them, you know, all the different influences he, and, and it kind of almost embodies the, uh, uh, that idea of the Seattle scene of taking all of these different, you know, musical genres and blending them together where he's got, you know, the Hendrix, the, the Stevie yeah. Ray, the metal, Eddie Van Halen. Kiss, you know, Eddie yeah. Van Halen, like every, it's all kind of thrown in together. And he is like that perfect embodiment, at least guitar wise of all these different, you know, performers. I, that's how I, that's how I hear it. I don't know. Well, then you also have to remember, and I know Rick would agree with me on this. I mean, we had, you know, in our band, we had Danny Newcomb and he was, he was as good as all those guys at like 14 Incredible. years old. Yeah. So I think having him in the band, Mike was always like, man, I gotta, I gotta step up my game. I mean, yes. I've got to be, yeah. this, this kid is already world-class guitar player, you know? Wow. So I think having that, I think Mike always felt a little bit like, you know, we're going to play together. I got to, I, I really got to do it. And I remember I, the real change is when he got the Kramer guitar. That's when yeah. he really, that's when he really started practicing a lot. He, need, he needed the proper instrument. He had a, yeah. He had a Paul Stanley ice van and it was holding him back and he got this Kramer. He worked at Burger King to save the money and he bought this Kramer and that sometimes you just need the right instrument to take you to the next level. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Yep. Absolutely. When, wow. um, when Mike jo joined up with Stone, and this was, I, I, you know, they they joined up, they started writing a little bit, and uh, Mike kind of, you know, intertwined and said, "Hey, let's let's kind of add Jeff into the mix." What was that whole period like? You know, just sort of this developing the band, and Chris, you were kind of there during some of it. Uh, with yeah, you gotta. Films, yeah, we have right? we have to go back a little bit because I believe okay. it was, I think Stone. It was there was Stone had his own deal at that point. And it was just called Stone Gossard. And he was writing a lot of those early songs that became Pearl Jam songs. The Gossman demos. Yeah, the Gossman demos. Yeah. 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 And those, Chris, that's the one. Those dollar the or something. Yeah. yeah. Dollar short. Uh, dollar short. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yep. So uh, I... Ballad is another, I think, in the e, e ballad, e -ballad Egyptian, yeah. uh, Egyptian, something, right? Had a right, bunch right. of different, yeah, unique mm -hmm. names for the uh, for the song that the uh, demos, yeah, yeah. The so, what the way I the way that I came on, he was kind of championing this uh friend of ours named Pete Droge that yeah. he had met, and Pete was very young, he's younger than myself, we love and, Pete. and so he brought me in to play on Pete's demo. He was trying to get Pete a deal, yeah, and I think around that time. He was he was also doing all the, the new songwriting post Andy passing away. But it's funny because I just did an interview a week ago kind of about some of the stuff I played on. And when I was talking to the guy, we were sort of breaking down the timeline. And it's really quite amazing when you think about how quickly all this stuff came together. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that Andy passed away in March. And then, you know, I think I was... I think I was rehearsing with them in May, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Wow. But but I could I would have to look at the dates. But um, so they brought me in. They already had Matt Cameron tapped to do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But they brought they brought me in for three songs because they wanted a very particular feel that I think he saw that I could do with Pete, and that's why they picked me to play on Times of Trouble, and then what became Black, and then there's a song called The King that it actually. I didn't even realize this until very recently, but it actually, it's like the template for even flow. Right. Really? Wow. Yeah. I, I listened so. to it. I actually, I listened to it today and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, that sounds like Holy Roller. That sounds like something mother love. Well, that's what I like. Funkin' that, tired. That's what I did say. I mean, when we were doing that one, I said, this one reminds me of love boat. And they were like, yeah. And that's, and they, and they kind of wanted me to catch some of that Gilmore vibe and all that. But they kind of knew like for black and times of trouble, I could, I could do the nice sort of laid back four, four vibe, you know, Charlie Watts, Ringo, Phil Rudd, whereas many of their songs kind of have very complicated time signatures and different feels. And that's where Matt, it's funny that it kind of came full circle because Matt Cameron was the perfect guy then. And he's the perfect guy now, you know, I mean, I think he was the, the perfect guy and that's not to take anything away from Dave Cruz. And I mean, Dave Cruz and, came in and he brought in a very nice feel and he, he came up with all those parts for songs that they didn't have yet. You know, why go and um, Jeremy and um, release, you know, there's all kinds of things that came post what I played, Matt played, and then Dave came in, you know, so 
I give him a lot of credit. He's also another one of my favorites. When, um, when you first heard Stone's composition on a song like Black, Black is yep. one of the most revered songs, and then Times of Trouble, which became Footsteps. Like, what, what was your first reaction to those songs? Uh, well, you have to remember, we're hearing, I'm kind of hearing them as just like these very beautiful chords, yeah. instrumental. So I'm not hearing what the vocals became. And it's funny, actually, it was, you know, it ties into talking about the first show. When I saw that first show and they played Black, I think it went by without me even ever thinking. I mean, again, you have to remember, we're, I'm very caught up in the emotion of that show, but I think it went by without me even realizing that's one of the ones I played on. Wow. Because the vocals add so much to that song, whereas like with Times of Trouble, that song, even just the instrumental is so spooky and has such a cool vibe that mm -hmm. that one, I think right away I would have been, oh, that's the one I played on, you know? Right. And like, right. even, I think, that, I believe they played even Flo at the first show. They played and it they twice, played it. actually. Yeah. Okay. They, uh, sound checked <laughs> with it, then uh, yeah. played it in the. They sound checked with it, and it sounded like you know uh, a, a forty-five uh, playing spinning in reverse or something like that. It sounded <laughs> slow, uh, yeah. and then once they they kick into some somewhere in the middle of the set, and it actually sounds pretty normal. It sounds good too. Yeah. You know, some of those yeah. songs. I don't know if you guys have gone back and listened to that show, but. Mm -mm. I have it. No, never. Some of that stuff is kind of like, ooh, I can see where, you know, they would want to work on it. But then you listen alive. to Black Alive. Those yeah. sound really, really good. Oh, yeah. I, well, it's funny because we, we the have interview this interesting, like, like, like viewpoint of this thing, because I remember we, Chris and I used to share a van. And I remember dropping them off. There was some house university district where you practiced with Stone and Mike. I don't know if Jeff yeah. was there. And he was there. Were, yeah. And I just sat and watched it, and it was like really interesting to hear these songs develop. They were kind of classic rock, but some of it was kind of complicated, and mm -hmm. you were trying to work on the parts with them just to get it together. They didn't quite have the drummer yet. Right. That was Larry Steiner's house. Larry Steiner's house, that's right. It was on the yeah. app, yeah. He, if, in the uh, Alive video, there's a shot where there's a guy upside down, almost like Jesus Christ being passed on the crowd. Okay. And his eyes are bulging about. out. And that's that's Larry Steiner. <laughs> okay. And so and we had <laughs> now I gotta go back and watch. <laughs> and we've had, a, we've had a Chris and I have had a band called L Steiner since about 1990, 91. And it's like a funk punk kind of thing. He's the singer of that band, but he and Eddie okay. actually we were super tight when Eddie first moved here. Wow. So it's actually kind of and actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. again, to tie into that very, very first show, Larry was there. And this yep. is the first time we all met Ed and everything. I mean, I think I met Ed like 10 minutes before they went on at the bar. And I believe, if I have the story right, the show was done. And maybe one of the other bands had played. I can't exactly remember. But Larry was wearing this red velvet, velvet. jacket. And yep. Ed said to him, oh, my God, I like that jacket. And, and Larry just... Larry, Larry took it off and gave it to him. And that is the jacket that Ed was wearing when he sang with the doors, I believe at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The Rock Hall, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh my goodness, yeah. wow. I, I can see it. <laughs> wow. I can see it, damn. And wow. that's, also very, that's also very Larry. He's just such a loving, peaceful guy. He also, if you watch Drop in the Park into the YouTube videos, he's the complete maniac that is behind up and down. Abrazis. Oh. Yeah. Bouncing yeah. up and down. Yeah, oh, okay. almost, okay. almost, you know, like right. almost getting a little annoying. Like I think they had to move him because I think he was getting <laughs> <laughs> too distracting. <laughs> it was <laughs> only Ed can be the antics. He's yeah. a wonderful guy, and he's been a part of our life. But um, wow. getting back to the question about the, sh the first show, and, and this is what I told this guy a couple weeks ago about that show. I said, you have to remember everything that, had, you know, the timeline is such a big part. I mean, yeah. And that was the other thing with recording with Stone. It wasn't so much about the songs. I was also just sort of like as a friend, like I was so proud of him that he had kind of risen to the occasion after Andy passing away. I mean, a lot of guys would have put their, guitar in, a, give, put their guitar in a case and yeah. sort of given up for a few years. And also, I was also just very uh, happy that he was able to get Jeff back in the mix. And I think Mike was very key to that. I'm not sure. Yeah. He really talking about that but yeah. so then you get to the show and then you know there's a fair amount of people i think like rick said it wasn't totally packed but there's a good amount of people but the people that are there know them and there's just so much uh they're there for a reason yeah, yeah there's so much there pent up excitement yeah. and there's just a lot of like 
we love you. We don't want you to fail and please don't suck. <laughs> you know, like, because, you know, I had just met this guy and it, I mean, I'd heard Mike played me a cassette of him. Yeah. Before I knew what Eddie was going to sound like. But yeah. We, we heard the you, tape of him. You, you just weren't. Sh- uh, no, I think he, just I don't think it was called me. that then. No, I think he just played me alive. I think I just heard one yeah. song. Okay. Yeah. There was yeah. actually, I think, along with the um, uh, the myth of the Mama Son, I think there was another demo of Ed it just was. doing his own thing on acoustic. There too. was, and I think that's mm. the one that Mike played for us. No, no, I, break- no I, heard the one, I heard the one with him from our demo we did. It was just a okay. lie. And, uh, but anyway, so they come out and they do release, and it was so perfect and incredible and ed was voice was so perfect that and i was telling somebody this is just like it kind of didn't matter what they did after that it was they they'd hit it out of the park i mean you kind of mm-hmm. knew it was going to be great and you know right and and obviously they did a bunch of great songs afterwards it ended up on their first record but just right away that first song was so perfect and and also ballsy. I mean, there weren't many bands that were coming out, kicking out their show with slow songs. I right? was right. going to mention that. Yeah. Cause that's and a lot something... of people do that now. A lot right. of people do that now. We used yeah. to do that, you know, that trend. Yeah. My, my, one of the bands, my brother and I had easy that became give. We, we would do it. Uh, my wife's band, lazy Susan would do it. You know, um, it was a bold move, you know, very brave. I mean, usually would come out with like your most kick-ass fast yeah. song. You know, yeah. everybody's running around hyper and, letting you know what they got, you know, they're really showing off their musical ability, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and they, they came out with that and it was just, it was like, I, it, it was a tearjerker then. And then I, you know, when they did the home shows, they did it uh, pretty early in the set. And yeah. I had kind of this flashback to that and it was kind of a tearjerker too. It was just like, there will always be something about that song that really was uh, perfect. You know, it was just a perfect introduction to, what they were about and what he, what his vocals were going to be capable of, you know, to me. Wow. And that's, I mean, that's, that's incredible that on first listen, you know, I, I think we talked about it cause we, we did the, the off ramp show in, in, uh, in full coverage. Um, yeah. And we talked about just how first bands, whenever, whenever you go on stage for the first time, you're nervous, you, you know, yep. you're looking out into the crowd. There's some people, you know, some people you're trying to impress people and, and you're trying to almost do too much and, yep. you know, it, play it, too fast. <laughs> yeah right like all right run out of breath always, yeah. always. run on stage always. like you guys ready are you guys ready like things like that and it just seems like like the opposite s- for them almost yeah. that that sports yeah. cliche act like you've been there before right that's yeah. what this is well i think oh, it was yeah. also coming out of the death of andy and that whole yep. the whole dream of getting a record deal which even back when they got a record deal it was still kind of unheard of to get a record deal in seattle and i think them coming out of that death, which was really hard and, and on the whole scene, because we all believed Andy was going to go places. And mm-hmm. so I think that's probably another reason why they were coming at it from a different place and having a new singer trying something different, you know. And, uh, you know, Ed was totally different than anybody else in Seattle at the time. Like his his approach, it almost reminded me of Michael Stipe in a way. Like his, his whole approach to being on stage on that first show was completely unique than what anybody else was doing in Seattle at the time, probably because he wasn't from here, you know? Yeah, yeah I always remember, I always remember he, when I met at, when I met with the bar, he had like a hat and it seemed like he had like a, a, like a jacket and like two or three shirts on it. And it was really funny because he kind of came on and like little by little, he just kept taking more and more clothes. Party. <laughs> <laughs> which, which you have to remember too, in Seattle, it was kind of the opposite of that. I mean, everyone would come on and like, uh, shorts and maybe right away they'd have their shirt off or like a yeah. off t-shirt i'm just you know, thinking chris cornell, chris right cornell yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You would, you would, it was the opposite you would come out you know with very little clothing on because it was going to be hot and uh and uh so right away when i met him he kind of struck me as a very different style of person and it was funny right. I, I can't remember if it was that time that i met him or the the next time i met him he said to, he looked at me and he said oh i heard about you two brothers <laughs> like he, he 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 had heard about the Friel brothers. Like he he laughed. He said he said, "Oh, I know about the Friel brothers." <laughs> yeah. So right. I think Mike must Mike must have told him some uh, the funny right, uh, right. Uh, Very funny. shenanigans of living together with us. You know. Yeah. Did, did Ed first, fit in right time, away? 
It feels What's like that? you fit it. It feels like you fit in right away. Like he Absolutely. moves up and you yeah, know, he's, yeah. he's such a humble, pleasant hu- human being to be around. And he's up there for two weeks and I'm sure he's shy. I'm sure he's, you know, this is a, an area he's barely ever been to before, if ever um, he, he fit in right away. Yeah. Well, I think well, you got, Seattle is, it's, we're all very, what makes us unique is we're so welcoming to everybody mm-hmm. and that we're very loving and supportive. It's a very, very supportive scene of just friends and family. And, and I think Pearl Jam's kept that since they started of having this little circle of people around them all the time. And I think that he was welcomed with open arms. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't there, but I give a lot of credit. It sounds like to uh, Chris Cornell and probably mm-hmm. Mark Arm and some of those people that yeah. welcomed him you know, they kind of brought him in, you know, maybe some of the other lead singers that made him feel comfortable. I mean, you have to imagine the, <laughs> the weight that he was probably feeling. I mean, Andy was such a giant figure in so many different ways and to complete opposite to, to be sort of, try, you know, the bar was kind of high for whoever they were going to get, you know? So I think that had to be a lot of pressure, especially that first show. I mean, what I remember he, you know, it took him a while to unwind and then, eventually he was kind of you could see some of the early uh style that he would eventually use a lot on stage but at the first show he was like i said he was kind of unlayering like a lot of clothing if i remember right <laughs> i think it was around the time I, I think alive was the third song in i think at, at that point he was he was finally in a t-shirt I would yeah, like, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's hard yeah, for me to remember, you know, it, yeah. yeah, it's very hard for me to remember. I, like I said, it, it was kind of like after that first song, you're kind of like just emotionally gone. You know, I just it was just more like, OK, they got that one down. Now I know it's just going to be great. And and also Rick and I have a little di- different perspective. I mean, I, I mean, I was definitely kind of checking out cruising because I was always very curious who they were going to get on drums. Yeah. You know, there was a little yeah. com- competitive side to me right. that was like, what's what's up with this guy? But um we were just mostly very happy for Mike, you know, like there was just all, you know, he was our brother. So it's like, yeah, it, it was cool to see him land in a setting that was that great, you know? If and I you got to think that it, it's again, like the timeline it's, we came back in 1988 and then, you know, whatever he went through, it was not that long. And then, you know, less than two years, about two, a little over two years later, he's playing that show with Mookie Blaylock. So it really isn't that long of a trajectory, but I think he had to come home and regroup and kind of find himself and maybe step away from, you know, what Chris and I are doing and our way of, we had this almost family, the three of us, we were best friends. Yeah. So I think he had to go away from us and find his own path. You know what I mean? Right. I, you I know, just... it's funny with, when you say the Mookie thing too, like I, I, I'm obviously wrong on this, but I don't, I don't ever remember them being called Mookie at that show. I thought that they just kind of came on and had no name. And then their next show, they were Mookie Blaylock. But is that, is that, that right? Sounds, that sounds very possible, actually. Well, I, I got to show you. Oh, wait. Show you. Look Does in the date book. Movie? Can we go to the date book, please? He's got, he's got the book. <laughs> it doesn't say it Mookie. Says right here, it says MDM and MLB. Mm. Oh, so Mother that's like Mother oh. Love Bone and Mike. Yeah. Part two. I, I, I yeah. think Chris is right. I don't think they even had a name. Mm. At, well, maybe maybe by the time the show did, but you know, writing it down when I was planning to go see the show, I wrote wow. MDM and MLB off ramp, Mike List fun. So that's, that's interesting because <laughs> yeah. I think that they were passing some tapes around, and in the inset of the tape was a Mookie Blaylock uh, basketball, basketball card. card, and that's how the name came about. I don't know. I'm going to guess that that would probably be before this show. I, I would I would think that they if they were being billed as anything, that would be it. You know, I, I don't know if there w- was no billing for them. You See, know, that's if there was that, anything that said like who was playing at the off ramp, do you have like a listing or a poster? Was there anything? It was, it's, it, I looked it up as Inspector Love and Bathtub Jim, but see, I don't, I don't, I think that we bailed. Like, I don't think I even hung out after they played. I think Green, I Green Apple Quick Step was, was, uh, yeah, the closer that night. But I think they were called Inspector Love and the Ribey Babies. It was. Like that. Oh, it that's was right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then it says Bathtub Jim. And that, and like I said, that's where it gets a little confusing because Kim and Tim and Brian definitely played some show, but they could have been. There's another show where it was. I believe Allison Chains, Mookie Blaylock, and Sweetwater, and 
that might be the show that Kim and Tim played on because that's they definitely right. were Mook, Mookie at that one. So they played the off ramp quite a few times in like ninety and also ninety one. I think there was like a handful of shows at the off ramp in ninety one. Then they played the Vo- they played the Vogue and they played the, the Vogue. Vogue. So they played with us at the Vogue. The yeah, we opened for them. Yeah, El Steiner and uh, uh, Eddie sang "God of Thunder" with Larry for a second. Remember. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then uh and Eddie and Larry's like, Eddie, I need you. I'm calling you out. Eddie. Wow. Yeah. So Eddie, Eddie ended up singing a little bit with Larry. That's we have that on videotape somewhere. Oh my funny. god. Oh, I want to see that. Yeah. Well now, oh, now you, you said it, now you have to get shed. it. Now, now, yeah, now, now you gotta find it. At some point <laughs> yeah. now you have to get it. So I've got yeah. it. I have it. Trust me, I have everything. So I, I have it somewhere. So yeah, my if brother's the that, key, he's the keeper of all that stuff. <laughs> I just really want to ask a, 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 you know, not a quick question, but a question to both of you guys. Um, Cornell um, and just Soundgarden in general, because I, as much as I'm a huge Pearl Jam fan, second right behind him is Soundgarden. I just would yeah. love to know some of your memories and stories, whatever you can offer, just your thoughts, just on the on the band, but him himself and just everything, because I, everything you read. Uh, the books and and anything else they it's just always there's discussion about they're like the first ones you know green um obviously mud honey's there but uh, soundgarden really of the big four so to speak they're always considered like that first uh, well, band so green river was here. green river was before that green right, river was right. first because right. they had um, on homestead and i think rehab doll might have been the one of the first releases on sub pop before the soundgarden ep right mm mm-hmm. mhm I so they, green, I think the Green Room one came out first, pretty sure. Yeah, Rehab yeah. Doll. And so I think they were there first. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that they were, a lot of people in Seattle were really into Black Sabbath. And I think they definitely right. had some of that. But Seattle was also kind of this punk rock thing and your own thing. And so we were just really lucky to grow up where we did because it was very small little incubated area where you just could create your own sound. So obviously there was some Sabbath influence, but they were going to do it through their own way. And there was also this punk rock scene and independent scene, alternative scene. And so that's how you end up with the Soundgarden sound, which is so interesting because it's super dark, but it also has a little bit of prog with Matt Cameron mm-hmm. being a big Rush guy at a fan. Definitely. And then... And then, you know, Kim's doing his thing. And then Hero was amazing. And he brought his own unique style. Then, you know, Chris had this incredible voice that really nobody else had except for maybe like Jeff Tate. Nobody really sang like that in Seattle. And he did so effortlessly. Right. And to go from drumming, too, to that. Right. Just like amazing. Like I didn't know I mean, about it until later. Yeah. But Chris, Chris actually has a funny story. Remember you saw Soundgarden open for Love and Rockets? Uh, well, I, th- yeah, there's, there's been some debate whether it was Love and Rockets or Gene Loves Jezebel, but oh, maybe it was. I'll, I'll, I'll even go back a little bit farther. I mean, I think my early, earliest introduction to them was Susan Silver. She had managed this band called the U-Men, who was kind of important oh, right, right. in mm-hmm. yeah. early, early Seattle days. Absolutely. So, so I can't remember who it was because we were always, Shadow was always kind of trying to get, you know, maybe get her in, introduced to yeah. her or whatever. And I think one of the times we were trying, I think that somebody said, Oh, now she's managing this band called Soundgarden. And I was like, Oh, well, they must be good. You know, I want to check them out. And, and I never did get a chance. And then I went to, I believe it was Gene Loves Jezebel, right? Like not totally right. At the the Moore theater. And I walked in and I think they were like just sort of finishing. So I didn't really get a chance to hear it, but they were sort of like done. And then I was like, you know, sitting down and you have to remember like, you know, in my mind, you know, I, I had just like a little bit of like a, you know, like a rock star thing, you know, you did things you did and you didn't do. And I'm like sitting there and then they get Being done professional. And, and Matt Cameron, like he, he walked away and then all of a sudden he came back and he started tearing down his drums. <laughs> and I was like, like, you're like, where is his roadie? You know, why Chris didn't like it. <laughs> and, I, and I think I, that was like, a, you know, like the first stupidest thing I probably told Rick the next day. He's like, well, did you see Soundgarden? I said, oh, it was lame. He tore down his drums. And, you know, <laughs> you know and that's just, that. you know, that's just yeah. being a kid and being competitive. You know, so I was sort of like, I think I might have had my knives out for them a little bit just because, you know, we weren't sure what they were about. And then, you right. know, um, but like I said, <laughs> as soon as I heard, I, I you know, I, I, I didn't really see, I don't think I actually fully saw them until probably getting back from LA, but I certainly heard them 
on the record. And that to me that, you know, when I heard the record, that was like right away, I was like, man, something is really happening in Seattle. Yeah. That's also very right. different. You know, their, their influences like Rick just went through They're they're taking influences from very different places, yeah. you know, and there's also just no denying Chris's voice. When you heard it, it was incredible. So right away you knew it was something great, but I, it took me a bit to see them. I want to say that I finally saw them on the Loud Love show. Upper uh, show? In, no, in, uh, at the more when they had Jason Everman playing bass. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what's funny is that I wanted to tell that story about Chris getting mad about Matt, Matt tearing his drums down. Because <laughs> we were coming from, Chris and I and Mike were coming from such a different place of like, being really professional and having stage clothes and yep, yep, yep. curtain closes and it was like arena rock like that's what we were shooting for a shadow was to be this big band so like even seeing the back of the one of the sound guard where he's wearing cutoffs we were like what is this all about you know how come you're not wearing these cool rock jeans or spandex <laughs> or <laughs> leather pants like it was yeah it was hard for us Peace, i mean we, 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 we always have thought very visual so I mean, you look at the pictures of Shadow, we were like super dressed up and had our own little outfits. And it was never, we were not going to just walk on stage with what you wore that day. Like we had outfits to wear. And, you know, and to, to a degree, Pearl Jam does that too. They kind of have their things they wear on stage. But mm -hmm. so for Chris and I were just coming at it from this visual perspective of just not really understanding what people in Seattle were doing. Because we were so immersed in Hollywood where you go see these bands and they have these perfect outfits and they're, super professional and they're all trying to get record deals and we were trying to navigate our way in hollywood where we kind of stuck out like a sore thumb like we were aware we're from seattle but we really were trying to enmesh ourselves in hollywood but mm -hmm. so seeing the sound guard now we're like what's happening what is this or you know we, we didn't really understand whereas like by the love bone they kind of got dressed up a little bit you know so we yeah, were, oh yeah we were we were just sort of in a humorous way just not understanding the thing with mike and chris and i is that we just laughed at everything we laughed at everybody everything our friends our you know other bands like we would just kind of make fun of everything because we just lived in this world the laughter that chris and my dad sort of started which is just humor so everything was humor and like when we first met stone he sarcasm. was super sarcastic so he just fit <laughs> right in with us so everything was like a big joke like everything's a joke like you're a joke this this is a joke that band's a joke like it's just a way of navigating the world with humor so i think that was part of the thing that I wanted to tell that story about Matt Cameron, because it was just kind of a funny way that Chris and I saw the world at that mm. time, you know? Oh, look, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is the one thing that it probably does get a little bit lost, but like, you know, the, like, you know, Stone and Jeff, I mean, those guys are really actually quite funny guys, but I don't think they Very get the funny. opportunity to show that off. I mean, and, and I think Mike does a bit, but he, you know, they, there's, there's definitely, a, I think, to be in the music business and to, to last for a long time, you really do have to have a sense of humor. And I think yeah. that's definitely um, something that we had early, early on. And also, you know, touching on the thing with L.A., like when we were there, you have to remember the, the Seattle thing had it had no cachet. Like it didn't mean anything no. to anybody. But we said no we're from Seattle. I mean, people didn't really know where it was or didn't really didn't know. care, you know. Which is funny to think that like in like two years, this – bomb was going to drop on LA yeah, and they they had no idea like whatever that was when Nevermind came out like they had they had like what's Seattle never heard of it all of a sudden it's like Whoa, it just yep. blew up yep. so, <laughs> or then yeah. you, we would we kind of would catch like the back side of it I remember touring with the band that Rick and I had and we were you know going through certain areas and you would you know you would load in and there'd be like these really grumpy sound men that are just so tired of like the next Seattle oh, yeah. band they're just like oh yeah they just they had just had it you know they, they were, were over like, it oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, they were just like, oh, gosh, it's just like, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot, of, a lot of fatigue from sound men, for sure. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Speaking of Chris and continuing on with that, um, he uh, let's let's because uh, there's a bunch of myths and legends about this. So while we're at it, uh, he auditioned for for Shadow. What was the time? He did. When he when did. did that happen? And well, what I was would, the whole thing I, like I would say that was probably 83 or 84. Right, Chris? I honestly, really. this I'm going to put the ball in your court on this one because this. this well, is I remember it really well because <laughs> our singer Rob, uh, he calls he calls himself Burko now, but he called himself Burko since the '80s. But he was always quitting, or we would fire him because the four of us had this really strong work ethic where we practiced five days a week, no matter what the weather. Like you know, girls would come by and want us to go swim with them, and we'd say no. And 
you know, or the, the snow, <laughs> anything we would practice. That's, that's why I'd say that, you know, why Mike is so good is because the four of us always practice and Berko didn't really have that work ethic, which in retrospect, we probably could have used a little bit of Berko, but we were, we were just determined to be the best band we could be. And so one of the times we had these strings of auditions and I remember this guy came in and he was wearing, uh, he had short curly hair and he was wearing army pants and like a white beater shirt, you know, the white undershirt. And he came in and he got, we were handing out these demos and he just struck me as weird. I just thought this guy seems really strange. That was the hair and, he had back then. Yeah, yeah just yeah. kind of yeah. a, a weird vibe. You know, we had a bunch of people. We had some women audition. We had different, you know, people try out, but we didn't even let Chris like sing with us. I just thought, said like, all right, you know, listen to the tape and call us back. And he called me back and wanted to try it. And I just kind of blew him off, you know. And and the funniest part of that story is that when Mike started doing Temple, he called me on the phone. And he said, the first day they got together, Chris Cornell came up and said, look, man, it always bothered me. You never let me try out for Shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he say something along the lines of, aren't you one of those Shadow guys? Well, no, I, I think he knew who Mike was, but Mike <laughs> called me from the... Mike called me from, I think, practice or the studio and said, do you remember this guy? And I was like, oh, my God, I remember that guy. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I remembered him right away. And he just kind of struck me as a weirdo. Like, I just didn't like it. And so we kind of blew him off. We probably, you know, shaped the trajectory of life later on. But it's just kind mm. of funny that despite all Chris's success with Soundgarden, it always bothered him that we never let him try out for Shadow. <laughs> <laughs> It just goes to show we're all, we're all everybody's the same. We all have yeah. something where like oh, I didn't get the chip chance. on your sh Yep, absolutely. Oh my god. So I yeah, I mean the bad. only thing funny. I could I I don't remember that. I, I I may have maybe I was not there. I mean I know that you we might not have been out, there. I, we were handing out cassettes, and that was one of those funny things that you heard about later. But uh, my only guess is that you probably may have told me about it because I was always the one that was like pushing to get Rob back because I. Yeah, I will. You know, I would ne I've never been the best with change. I'm still not the best with it. No, but, uh, I think I was always trying to keep the five of us together, even though, you know, we, we would always have these record companies say, oh, man, your singer is terrible. And right. You know, but we were definitely like the five musketeers and we were trying to like, yeah, figure out a way. And we, and we very much liked Rob's stage persona and all this stuff. For so sure. I think if there was anything that went to that, I'm sure Rick could have said, oh, this guy came by and he, I gave him a cassette and I was probably like, don't even bother. I want Rob back, you know, or something yeah. like that. And you're not knowing that it's this amazing <laughs> singer that could have, <laughs> could have joined, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's just kind of funny. Like you just, the, the, the thing Chris is saying is really true is that like with the first Pearl Jam show, you're just kind of in your own world. Like you're, you're watching Mike play, but we had our own band going on at the time and he was also playing with other people. So your life's going on. So, you know, Chris Cornell auditioning for us, I don't think we would even consider it because, you know, Rob was our singer and we all had known each other since sixth grade. And yeah. so we eventually got him back again. And it's like, how would I you knew, know then? You would never know. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, right. also I think, you know, what made Shadow unique was the fact that we had these, we we're these four amazing musicians. Then we had a guy who technically couldn't sing, but he had a really cool, style like i don't know if you've heard the first two iron maiden records but that's kind of their thing was like great musicianship and this sort of punk rock singing and yep. you know you got to remember that that was a big element in seattle even though we were not punk rockers there was a big punk influence going on in seattle at the same mm -hmm. time as metal and yep. prog and everything else so and rob really brought that and i think also rob brought our professional level up because he's the one that showed up with a bag full of spandex and bullet belts and cool clothes and we didn't have any idea how to dress so he's the one that brought that fashion sense into shadow which we definitely had mm. but that's the chris wow. cornell story wow that's wow. that's i that's mean funny yeah right you, you never yeah, know I, I, what could have yeah, been. yeah that's the thing i can't i can't add much to that mike like i said we my guess is i was probably not there and if if, if i was i probably would have pushed him out the door <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we, 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 we probably had like 20 people come by to try out for the band. I don't think even, <laughs> I want to talk about that first show because Go for what it, yeah. I do remember really well was that, you know, we would always go see our friends play, whether it was Green River or Love Bone or anybody. And you'd watch the show and you'd like the show and then you'd hang out afterwards. But you were never really blown away. And I remember being at that first show and it was the first time I ever thought about any of our friends bands. 
I think these guys could be big. That was the first time I'd ever thought that way. You know, you never really thought it's kind of a Seattle thing of not wanting to be too big. But I remember being at that show and thinking, I think these guys could be big because they combined like classic rock with this unique way of singing. And they kind of the way I don't think Dave Cruzan gets enough credit the way he was playing, too, because yep. he, he's so influential. Like pretty much everybody started doing that double tap thing immediately. And that was his thing. And he played soft, but it was a double tap. And I think it was like interesting. Like I kind of heard Bad Company. I heard Kiss, mm -hmm. but I heard like maybe some weird, almost like R.E.M., like I said, in the singing a little bit. And then they had this, the drumming and Mike tapping into this passion. The thing with, with making it all together, I honestly thought like, I think these guys can be big. I know it sounds funny now, but you got to remember back then, Nobody had any idea that they were going to be big. It's a crapshoot. But I left there thinking that. And that's the first time I've ever thought that. I almost never think that about our friends' bands playing, you know? It, be, it, it almost became, you know, like you said, you would, you would go to almost like support your friends. And then it yes. became like, oh, I'm going to go to the show. Like, this is like yep. a show now. Like, they're a, a full-blown, you know, rock, rocking, kick-ass band now that I want to go see. Well, I, no, I, we, still, we still thought of it just going to see our friends. I mean, I never thought... Sure. And if, I mean, I still think that about Mike, that he's my friend and we go see Mike play and Mike puts him on the list and you see him after the show, but it's- But there was you, a feeling I of something think, bigger think, there. Yeah. I don't think Chris and I, I, I guess speak for myself, but I don't think we can ever see Mike the way the world sees Mike. You know, we can't see him the way, every, you know, everybody else sees him because we grew up with him. He was like our brother, he still is our brother. And so you're just seeing your friend play, even if they're playing this giant T-Mobile park in these, huge shows or at PJ 20, but you're still, he's still your friend. So your heart is kind of going towards him and mm. you're seeing him with love. You're not really seeing him as this amazing guitar player. I got to tell a funny story. So I took my wife to see Temple the Dog and she had never seen Mike play. And Mike got us these little chairs on the side of the stage next to his amp. And of course it's amazing show. And yeah, my wife, Kitty, just do him as our friend, Mike. And so we watched the show and I've seen Mike play so many times by them, but, and after the show, we went to his dress room and she goes, you know, you're really good. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but it was coming from a place of honesty that right. she just was right. You were just she so didn't impressed. Know. Yeah. She didn't know. Yeah. And she had never seen him play and we're, you know, we were about 10 feet from him and you, she got to see him for the first time. <laughs> and so That's funny. And she's like, you're really good. And he's like, thank you. And he wasn't being sarcastic. He was, <laughs> he was probably very he, honest about it. Yeah. He knew where she was coming from. And I think that's the thing that with everybody that's been in Pearl Jam is this amount of musicianship. Now, you know, I got to get back to Dave Cruzan for a sec. I, he's my favorite Pearl Jam drummer, besides my brother, of course, but on the demos. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, what I, but I think that, you know, Dave brought is was so unique and his style was so original and i know he's been so influential on people he might not have had the passion and the fire of you know dave abrazis but, but like when we went to the rock and roll hall of fame and got to hear him play that song like oh that's right that's what this used to sound like it's a lot softer and i don't even chris could probably do drum speak just but just the way he plays and his style was so unique and you hear it in so many other people. He really brought this interesting thing that I've never really heard anybody else do. And that's not taken away from Abrazis or Irons or uh, Matt Chamberlain or Matt Cameron or anybody, but he just has a really incredible thing. And I think that he's a big part of why that first record is sounds so incredible. They've been, they've been, you know, blessed with great players, you know, Matt Chamberlain included. Yeah. I was gonna um, say, like for, for a band that's had no drummers, it's had so many yeah. drummers. They've had some really damn good drummers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just waiting for my yeah. chance. You know, I'm waiting for Matt Cameron to explode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he'll eventually explode. He'll ex he'll be like Spinal Tap. You know, he'll explode on stage, <laughs> and then I can jump. In. <laughs> They're ready. They're waiting. Yeah, I, when I did that interview the other day, I did tell the guy. I said, you know, I'm just still waiting for my chance to. You know, I want to play black with them on stage. That's my my yeah. goal because because I played on the demo, so it's only fair I could uh, get, do at least do it you once. Played on, um, Home shows should have been your opportunity, man. Yeah. Hey, I was waiting. Yeah. I was waiting. He was there <laughs> in the wings. He was. There. <laughs> yeah, it's in the date book. Look it up. 
Yeah, I'll do like the Tanya Harding. Like, I'll knock Cameron in the knee. And... <laughs> <laughs> you did demos with Eddie for Yield 2, Chris, right? Yeah, yes. Really? Yeah. Wishlist, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, Wishlist and MFC, and I think there were some MFC. other things. And, That's you awesome. know... He's, he's definitely a man of few words. He, you know, he came in and he didn't really say much. And then we just started playing. And then it was really funny because the way it happens with Mike lots of times is he'll just book studio time and we'll just play and play and play. And I don't yeah. know what's going to be what. And one day we were just there and he, he never mentioned that Ed was coming and didn't, I don't even know if he mentioned it to John who was engineering, but there was a knock on the door and there was Ed with his telly. And he opened the door and he just came in, opened the case, and we pretty much just <laughs> went right to it. I mean, I think he said hi and started strumming. And um, I think we even played a little bit of corduroy just to kind of warm up. And then we started playing wish list. And he, the only thing he said to me was he said, no symbols. Don't hit any symbols. And it's funny because when you hear the recording of that, it is very straight. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then what was so great was, so I'm playing, I'm like going, holy f- fuck this is great you know and <laughs> this is awesome and you played mfc and you know you've never heard these things and he gets done and all i can think of in my mind is like i have to get a cassette of this and we're all standing there and i mean it's just now it's just me sitting in the recording room and then i'll see in the control room is john and mike and Ed. This, this is uh john goodmanson <laughs> by the way john yeah. goodmanson yeah. okay yeah and uh you can see them and they're talking and uh and they come out and I was like, oh, oh that was fun. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and Ed goes, okay, so I need that dat. Oh. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, like, I'm no. like, what? And he goes, I have to have the dat. And so he, he's the only guy that has that. As far as I know, I think he's the only guy I would love to have it, but he's well, the as only far guy as I know, you're, that. you're friends with Mike. <laughs> Mike's friends with Ed. Mike might so, know Ed. Can't you like talk to one of the? <laughs> well, that's not a damn dat machine. I probably need like a time machine. <laughs> yeah. Where are you gonna find a dat machine? Yeah, but you know what? Knowing Ed, he probably has a machine in his house. So you know I was about to say, yeah, yeah, he's probably taking quarantine. It's not out of the realm of possibility, Chris. Let's let's not. Uh, let's yeah. not go, you, might, you might be able to get it. You never know. Yeah, yeah he has a little bit of everything. Like he has, yeah. you know, every first edition of a book. Every. Yep, baseball, yep. baseball hat. He has wow. the Batman outfit. He has, you know, there is a he, tiny chance that John might have made another one, but I haven't. I'd have to pick John's brain yeah. out someday. That's but funny. I always feel kind of funny when I tell that story because like, there's really no proof. You know, it's just like, oh yeah, I swear <laughs> it happened. The unearthed yield demos. Oh yeah, my yeah. If we, yeah, if we ever look, there's so much that's in the vault that you know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We we have we'll no probably idea never what's hear it. You'll end. never hear it. You'll right. never. You'll yeah. Never hear it. <laughs> right. Uh, before yep. you know, I don't want to keep you guys mu- too yep. much longer. I got two more things about that night. Um, one kind of, you know, is a, is a silly, you know, myth rumor kind of thing. There is, has always been this rumor that's been passed around that Randy Johnson, the Seattle uh, Mariners pitcher was there. The big unit. He's kind of hard to miss. Do, do you guys, have you Stands heard out. this before? Do you, I, do you I have this? heard that. I don't remember him being there, but I, okay. I have heard that. Okay. I, I think for me, I was just so focused on Mike and the show that in my mind, there was hardly anybody there because I think I was just having this, taking this experience in along with Chris and some of our friends. We were just so focused on Mike and our hearts were pushing out towards him, at least mine was. And so I don't even know who else was there. I mean, I, in my mind, it wasn't very crowded, but I wasn't really focused on anything except for the show. And it was just such an exciting night. It was just so yeah. incredible in so many ways. And the thing that with Mike, that's so important that almost no other guitar players have in history of music is that he taps into almost this atom bomb explosion of passion. You know, mm-hmm. you've been at those shows where all of a sudden Mike does a thing and everybody goes crazy. Oh, and it only comes from him yeah. and it's, it could happen. It's so spontaneous. Yep. And, you know, our good friend, Danny Newcomb, he's a prodigy, but he would be the first to tell you that's not his style. Whereas Mike comes from this thing where everything just goes, boom, it's out of nowhere. You and you don't know what's going to happen. You can't teach and that's, that. Yeah. yeah. And that was there at the first show. And he certainly had some of it in shadow as well, but I think he had much more room to do it with, Pearl Jam is that he just taps into this thing. And sometimes when I think about it, I almost get teary because just the way he plays, it's like he's so in touch with his center and his 
explosion of creativity and he's allowed that in Pearl Jam and he's the guy that you know you watch him with Pearl Jam a lot of times you watch him and Ed that's the show it's a they're lost you know Mike has this thing and it's so unique and I just I I don't think it gets talked about enough I mean you could talk about Eddie Van Halen or Hendrix or all the greats but there are a lot more there are a lot more immortality you listen to a song like immortality nothing as it seems Oh yeah. my God! How do people not put him on this level? Yeah. Um, even and even even the even flow solos that he pulls yeah. out live, like Absolutely. he is a live performer through and through. Well, he told the, me that yeah. we were recording Temple. That it was one of the songs. I know Chris knows this story too, where he was recording and he was so into it that the headphones flew off and it kind of got caught on his guitar and like everybody started laughing. But it was such a great take. Oh, I guess that's reached down. Was, Probably yeah. reached oh, yeah. down. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah, was like yeah. fell into it that like everything was just like you know okay good luck guys that's gonna come back later yeah <laughs> this was like you gotta remember like this was his chance this is the things that you know chris and mike and i dreamed about was having that chance to be on a major label and this was his first real chance and he just gave it everything he had and so of course everything's gonna go flying off and i could just see them all laughing and he told me that story later that chris was totally laughing i was just you know that's that's the thing about Mike that he just taps into this beautiful emotion and it's, it's just it's like an atom bomb and nobody else does that I don't think you could in the history of music no one's really done that except for him. Yeah, I give him a lot of credit too because he's also the guy that I mean he'll, you know he'll be playing in front of you know twenty thousand people and he'll he's not afraid to take risk I mean he'll 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 go all, all the way out there to yes. the point you know sometimes where he may make a mistake but it doesn't matter because the, doesn't matter. The passion is there. Oh, I incredible. think about Mike always whenever I'm watching him and I'm like a half-assed hack musician myself. Like if I'm up joking around with one of my buddies and we're jamming out, whatever. Anything like this, you know, yeah. he, go, he just kind of <laughs> leans back. Like, yeah. just, like staring oh, up into the sky. It's like, that's the Mike. Like that's oh, the yeah. McCready, you know, that's the McCready move where he's just kind of like staring up into the sky. Like that's where he's, he's in that zone, you know, and he's just, well, yeah, that, that's, that's what we're talking about. You know, that's why I agree with Rick. I think he, sometimes he doesn't get enough, credit for how tech, how technically good he actually is i mean i think yeah. that, in the full grand scheme i think i think sometimes yeah. he gets kind of folded in the envelope of you know pearl jam as this band and sometimes what gets yeah, missed is is yeah. um you know how damn technically good he is on guitar he's, right. he's very very actually fast and also <laughs> he's extremely um, fast incredibly yeah. um how about melodic, the ghost solo uh, melodic and like spot, and, and but still, you know, very spontaneous. And, and that's, that's what I, where Rick, I think is right on the money is that, right. that he's not afraid to just go there and, you know, all Pearl Jam shows are different, you know, and they do a shit ton of songs, but, you know, sometimes the show will just be going and, you know, you'll get kind of lost in it. And, and all of a sudden, Mike, it's like, <laughs> Mike, he just knows when to light it up. He like, knows he when, knows, yeah, he, yeah yes. he knows when. He's the guy that can kind of turn the show on, you know, it'll be sitting at a certain place. And then all of a sudden it's like at 10 again, you know, that's, right. that's why yeah. immortality is one of my favorite songs. And I feel yeah. like that's that mid set song where, okay, you get a couple, maybe a new song or something like that. The crowd kind of dips in and out and then yeah. immortality comes on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's the guy. <laughs> explodes into you. What, what are, you know, what are your, Guys, if you were to be put on the spot, like one mic performance, and it could be either a song that he performed and you saw that and said that that was incredible or just something that he he contributed. What is the one song to you that defines Mike McCready being in Pearl Jam? Well, I have a moment I remember when they were playing, I think the Mercer Arena, and it was the end of one of the songs and he was hitting this solo of a note and he just decided to smash his strat in the middle of it. And the whole place just exploded and cheered for Mike. And it was just this incredible, I'm getting goosebumps just telling you about it. It was just this moment where, I think they did maybe three nights at the Mercer Arena and he just decided to tap into that, you know, the the matrix or the void or the, the moment. And he just went in there and it just like, almost like you could see an explosion coming out and the, the guitar was broken at the end of the solo and it was just that's something that Pearl Jam does. They have these rising, rising, rising. And then you I think they kind of count on Mike to go kaboom, you know? Mm-hmm. And I thought that, that moment always stuck with me. It's just this moment where he really, really rose above. But I mean, really, there's been so many moments. I mean, you could go back to the first show and just I was so excited to see him play with them. And I, I 
know how hard he worked to become a great guitar player because he was not a naturally gifted guy like Danny Newcomb. He worked really hard, he worked really, really hard and became a great guitar player. I so love that. Yeah, I love that. I know seeing him at that first show, just how good he was. So I could say the first show or I could say you, you guys would know the date of that show, but it was a show at the Mercer Arena where Oh, he just was December. it 93 or 98? It was 93. No, uh, the, it was 93. Yeah, 93, okay. uh, that's the vault that came out last year. The, uh, that oh, was one of those oh, shows. December. So December 7, 8, and 9th. Yeah, oh, so it was a versus yeah. shows? Uh, yes. yes. It, yes. No. Yeah. yeah, it was, okay. it was yes. versus yes. because yes. they debuted or maybe not debuted, but it was like the first or second performances of Last Exit and Tremor Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that was on the night. And, and the Tremor Christ performance and that 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 vault show that's <laughs> on streaming. Sir, I mean, it's horrendous. Had, and I, it's one of my favorite songs. It's it's truly one of my favorite Pearl Jam songs. Horrendous. It's like they did not know what they were doing. That, so <laughs> but they were. Well, I think the last. Yeah, I think Ed was holding up a piece of paper during last exit yeah, too. I don't know. Whatever it was, but you know, the they got it down. I think I think it worked out all right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would say uh, about Pearl Jam that was unique too is that nobody in Seattle really was doing a different set list every night. I can't think of any mm -hmm. band prior to them that was doing a completely different set list every show. That's something I would really give them that's credit for. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah, Nobody that's else. true. Absolutely. Yeah. And now yeah, you I think so my, I think the answer I would go with it is I would stay kind of recent. I would say just even those home shows that he did, there, there, was, there was a couple. I had a feeling you were going to say that. On both nights. Yeah. I think you know maybe in black or and then also even oh black huh even even, even flow <laughs> there was a couple nights yeah exactly <laughs> he really wants to play <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just All talk right. about black we're, we're starting yeah. the hashtag yeah let Chris, let Chris play black <laughs> put it yeah. Rick can you please put in the date book for twenty I don't know how much of twenty twenty one we are but right we can now try yeah <laughs> let Chris play black but no he he lit it up pretty good on oh, a yeah. couple songs and oh, yeah. Just you, you knew he was going all the way. How about the uh, 2020 what, date book right there? So there we go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. PJ20 cool. was really special too because yes. that was them doing Temple, and I think that was pretty emotional for everybody to see, oh, you yeah. know, uh, we were singing there. about Andy. And I think that was a, a pretty, both those shows were pretty incredible, you know, just the whole thing. And just the people came from all over the world to be there. And those are really special too. And plus, I got to jump on stage. That was exciting. I got to do uh, Rocket in the Free World. I recognize uh, you at the end, and I know okay. why. I know yeah. why. Yeah, okay. I know why. He got the bass. He got I the bass. I know exactly why, because base, somebody looked thought, at you. I was next I'm to somebody. Make, this is a true story. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I, I was next to somebody. He looked at you and said, he was so <laughs> passed out of his mind. I swear he said that. He, he pointed at you and said, Dave Grohl. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? That would have started a good rumor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, I have yeah. a, a new job and we all have to wear masks. And this African American guy came in and I was wearing my mask. He goes, Yo, look like David Grohl. <laughs> <laughs> David Grohl. David Grohl, full name. He's like, I didn't ever tell you that. You look like David Grohl. Well, you see how guys. Ah, if, you know. if you shaved your beard off, you look like the guy from Nirvana. I think that. <laughs> but that was that was really funny. Like I got to Jeff gave me his bass, and I thought I'm going to make the most of this. So I went up on the drum riser, was rocking out with Matt, and then at the end of the song, I, I like said Danny Harrison there too. There's like a bunch oh, of yeah. he was. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Glenn Hansard and, and yeah, Josh yeah. Romney. Yeah. And so oh, we waited that. the song, and I said "Love Gun," you know, the Kiss song, "Love Gun." So he went, da -da -da, you know, so. <laughs> I thought I'm gonna make the most of it. There you go. <laughs> he got to hand it to Rick. He took over the show. He did. He did. <laughs> I see. I like even without him saying anything. I actually do remember <laughs> that very specifically. I was I was not too far back from the stage, and I was just seeing that. I just take yeah. that moment in, and everybody just being so excited. The celebration of that night was. was it was a, yeah. It was incredible. Both shows were incredible. I mean, I was were. really thankful to. Mike invited us to. I think he invited you, Chris. I don't know why you couldn't go. Remember? No, I think I had something going. I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. It was great, though. Well, guys, I, I <laughs> this just, is amazing. I want to thank That's you guys for, for joining us and so many amazing stories in there. I, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, I mean, I think at some point next year we're, we're gonna want to do PJ twenty. Would you guys want to come back for that? I'll do it. Yeah, I was there. Rick could do it. He was there for sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, 
maybe like around the the anniversary next year, September, we'll we'll uh, we'll get in touch. Because I, I think the thing that I want to put across, you know, and I've said it before, but you know, to us, Mike is family. It's a it's a very emotional thing. It's like it's not a friend. It's not a, a peer. Like he's like Chris said, he's our brother, and yeah. So you know, we have all these emotions about this thing because we're so happy to see the way he's taken off and had this great success. But he's, in the end, he's still our friend and we text each other goofy jokes that nobody would understand, you know? So <laughs> yep. it's, it, it's, he's this one thing, but to us, he's just Mike, you know, he's our friend and we yeah. love him. And, and he's always, was, yeah. he's yeah, always I, ready to talk about Kiss anytime. Yes. <laughs> and, and I would just say, you got to rock and roll a, all night and- And part, part of every day. Of every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think there's, a, I would just say, I think there's a lot of guys that would be in your position where it wouldn't be this way. You know, you wouldn't have this kind of relationship with, with a friend. Oh, yeah. like, and that's, and that's what we love. You know, that's great. Absolutely. So, for sure. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for having us. So once again, thank you so much to Chris and Rick. They were outstanding, outstanding human beings. And like they said a million times, Mike is a brother to them. Like, just the relation and you can tell when they were talking about it, we, we were on zoom. We were able to see their faces and they were just, they're so proud of their brother. They are. They are and so they could not have said it more. And, and you can't blame them. I mean, there, there's a real familial relationship uh, between these guys, these brothers and their brother, uh, Mike McCready. And just the thing about like being in their shoes, like to have been, friends with them friends with him growing up to then see him go on to rock superstardom yeah. in this way and playing all over the world and playing these sold out shows and then going in your hometown arena hometown arena in Seattle sometimes or T-Mobile Park whatever it is and seeing him play in front of a sold out show and just shredding his face off and melting faces uh, in front of tens of thousands of people all the time it's just it's got to be it's got to be some kind of trip for these guys to then to, to go see their friend doing what he's doing. I mean, it's just amazing. And they were, they Mike really, like you said, could not have been couch, nicer. You know, like, could not that's have been how nicer, close guys. it is. Yeah. Mike was sleeping on their couch at some point. So right. this was one of the best firsthand perspectives outside of, and I bet you, if you, if you ask one of the band members, you know, I don't know if they'd be able to paint the same kind of picture that no. they did. I, and how about know? the date book? We got the date book. The date book. The, the date, date book. book got, I mean, I mean Rick, Rick's got the dates in the book telling you day by day what he went to go see or i mean you, how could you get camera. more more of a detailed account we I, have the proof can't. we have yeah. the proof the one thing that we do want is uh the video oh god uh what 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 video was it that we want that uh we we asked him oh how about no how about the uh the demo tapes of mfc oh, and the demo uh, tapes of the Wish yield tapes MFC, yeah want, i want the yield tapes oh yeah wishless and mfc that oh. that uh chris says that he he demoed for eddie no, less symbols but there's uh like but the, what was what was the video that that oh, he said early that he show early yes he yeah said for a really early, early, early show. show one of the first few shows that maybe there's probably probably not any footage probably not that, no that we he might have rick might have so crossing fingers and you know maybe you know we'll keep you posted we'll keep you posted we'll on that posted. we'll talk to him and and see if he's kind see enough if we can to work it out digitize it yeah so but for now, look, uh, they asked us Thank to Thank you to Rick and Chris again. Thank, Thank you. you to Rick and Chris. They wanted us to promote something. We're very happy to do it. They're doing a live stream from the Royal Room on November 20th. It's Kim Virant, who is uh, Chris's wife, and they're going to be performing a couple of her original songs that Mike helped her uh, write and, and record, and they're going to play some Neil Young songs. They're going to play yep. some, some covers, and they're going to do some real cool stuff. And we'll, you know, obviously that's in a month, and uh, but we're gonna post it to our social medias once the time comes, and uh, you know maybe we make a little little celebration, a little live on four legs party, and uh, and get get the listeners, get the followers in uh, on this. Cause I think it, it'll Definitely. be it'll be something really exciting for sure, for sure. Can't wait. So great, great stuff today. Great stuff from them. We got more coming later this week. We got the Nassau Coliseum episode that's tomorrow on Thursday on our Patreon. We have the Bridge School episode from. 2003 it'll be the first night of 2003 if you're interested in that patreon.com slash live on four legs to head over and uh we shall see you tomorrow from nassau coliseum buckley i just want to personally thank you and uh, also a thank you a deep deep thank you goes out to dukes 
uh, Dukes Wooters, who was able to make this all happen. This wouldn't have happened without Dukes, and we are so grateful that he was so nice enough to even bring this up. So thank you so much. This was during just a conversation that we were having uh, on one of our video chats, and he was just like, yeah, why don't, you guys should interview Chris and Rick. Yeah, For sure. Yeah, why not? And we made it happen. Rick Rick told us he doesn't do a lot of these things, so we're really thankful that uh, that yes. he came out and talked to us. Definitely. So thank thank you to you, Randy. Thank you to the listeners, and thank you to to Dukes, and thank you to Chris and Rick Friel because they were fantastic. Really, one hundred percent for anything better. Thank one hundred percent. And I recommend, you know, if uh, if you listen to this, I recommend maybe like in a month or two, if you're feeling, you know, the the December blues, the kind of the winter blues. Well, listen to this again. I think this will get you out a little bit of a funk for an hour or so. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's going to be stuff we cut off this episode. That'll probably be on our Patreon. Be on the lookout for that because everything that was said in this episode is worth listening to. Definitely. So we're done for now. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to everybody. Uh, we will see you tomorrow for Nassau Coliseum. So this may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. Although we may be parting ways, I miss you already, and I miss you always. PJ30, folks, it's a great anniversary, and it'll be celebrated for the whole entire year. We'll see you tomorrow.